we're ready. So, uh, good evening um, and uh, welcome uh, to this uh, special interactive uh, session, uh, special session with, as part of the uh, Conrad Adenauer Stiftung uh, partnership. Uh, this interactive session is with, with Mr. Re, Director, Asia and Pacific Department, IMF. The topic uh, for today's uh, discussion is economic outlook for the Asia Pacific region with special reference to India. Uh, it's a pleasure to really welcome uh, Mr. Re, uh, who is the uh, director for the Asia uh, and Pacific Department of the IMF, where he oversees the fund's work uh, on the region, including its lending operations and bilateral and multilateral surveillance of economies ranging from China, Japan, India, uh, to the Pacific uh, Islands. Prior to joining the IMF, uh, Mr. Re was chief economist uh, of the Asian uh, Development Bank, where I also had the opportunity of meeting with him uh, earlier, and Secretary General and Sherpa of the Presidential Committee uh, for the 2010 G20 Seoul Summit, who was Vice Chairman of the Financial Services Commission and uh, uh, the Chairman of the Securities and Futures uh, Commission of Korea. He also uh, was a professor at economics at the uh, Seoul National University and the University of Rochester. Uh, Mr. Ree has published wide, widely in the field of uh, macroeconomics, uh, finance, uh, economics, financial economics, and on uh, the Korean economy. He holds a PhD from Harvard University and an undergraduate honors uh, degree from uh, the Seoul National University, both in economics. Um, also, a very special welcome uh, to Dr. Sangeeta Reddy, uh, President Fiki. Uh, he is also uh, uh, the uh, joint Managing Director of Apollo Hospitals. Uh, welcome, Dr. Reddy, for, for uh, at this uh, session. We will be joined by uh, Ms. Anne-Marie uh, Gulde, Deputy Director, Asia and the Pacific Department, IMF, and Mr. Ronald Salgado, uh, Mission uh, Chief for India, Asia, and the Pacific Department of the IMF. We also have uh, with us Mr. Peter Rimmel, Resident Representative uh, to India of the KAS. So welcome uh, to each one of you. And may I now request the President, Dr. Sangeeta Reddy, President Tiki, to uh, please give her welcome remarks. Dr. Reddy. So good evening, um, especially Mr. Ree and uh, all other participants from Tiki, as well as representatives of IMF. Uh, it is you know, insignificant uh, times that we are meeting, in significant and difficult times that we are meeting. Um, and I think that, you know, while on one hand we are forced to have social distancing, on another hand, this crisis is bringing us together in so many ways to find joint solutions to a difficult scenario. And uh, I want to thank uh, Mr. Chang Yong Ri for his uh, time and for agreeing to spend this time with us and give his remarks. Um, I believe that uh, it, is, it is well known not only that we're in the midst of a crisis, but the potential new normal or the disruption could go on for 12 to 18 months. I think um, governments, economies, individuals, and corporations uh, are all together trying to find ways to come back and find ways to reaccelerate the economy, to think through new business models, to appreciate the changing environments and understand how they should navigate in these new times. Um, just this morning, I read something uh, where it said that when the winds of change are blowing, some people put up walls, but others find ways to build windmills. And uh, I think Digital is one of these windmills, which is finding ways to connect us, is enabling people to work from home, is empowering our youngsters to learn from home and study from home, and is creating multiple new business opportunities. Uh, Fiki has been at the thick of things in terms of appreciating the problem of our, our uh, uh, not just our members, but the economy at large. And one of the significant surveys done in the country was initiated by FIKI. Uh, it was said that over 70% of industry uh, is estimated to have said that the impact on their business was high or extremely high and severe. 
And uh, further, almost 68% of them said that there would be a degrowth in sales in the fiscal year 2021. Uh, it's also uh, said that you know global growth is projected to be at minus 3% and Asia's growth at 0% and even while India is being has been revised downwards to 1.9 and though it looks positive I think the fall from the estimated 6 to 7% the fall is quite significant so we would love to one hear your views and your perspective uh, Mr. Chang Yongri, on uh, where you see the global economy, what you think will be the drivers of recovery, what your suggestions for India would be, and especially for our members in terms of the globe, uh, the changing geopolitical alliances, the new opportunities in disrupted supply chain, uh, effective global practices in terms of, of coming back, and some of the good insights you were giving me in the short conversation we had prior to uh, formally getting on the call. Uh, I think we also have tremendous labor shortages and our ability to, to deal with those labor shortages, but also at the heart of everything is this whole perception of fear. How do we overcome the fear, restart the economy, manage the supply shock and the demand shock on both sides? And also do so in an environment where our government, while we, we eagerly await the reconstruction package, which is due to be announced this week, uh, we are not a nation where uh, we have large surpluses available to give significant economic stimulus as well. Uh, and while we believe it's important, we would also uh, lean on you to give your message about this. Uh, I also think that the potential of India is tremendous. And so your views on the potential of our internal market, our production capacity, our intellectual capacity, uh, our youth and our positive demographic, and how we can manage this crisis, and any lessons that we can learn, whether they're from your global experience or specifically from South, South Korea, China, New Zealand, about people, jobs, economy, and the life uh, in general. But most importantly, I think, uh, on behalf of all the members who have logged in here today, we thank you for your time and want to appreciate the role that IMF plays at a global stage. Uh, the world is a better place because of the balancing act that you continuously perform. And we appreciate uh, the macroeconomic significance of the presence of IMF. And thank you so much for your time. With that, uh, over to you, Mr. Chang Yong Ri. Uh, thank you on behalf of you. Uh, President uh, Reddy and uh, uh, Mr. Chenoy and uh, Mr. Nimnel, uh, thanks very much for inv inviting us to this conference. Uh, it's very timely, and we are very honored. And also, uh, you know, good uh, good afternoon and good evening to friends and members of Fiki. And first of all, best wishes for your health and for your family. And we are very glad to share IMF views on this coronavirus event in globally. And so, why don't I first uh, upload my PowerPoint? and then start my presentation together with uh, my colleagues, uh, Ranil and Anne-Marie. Let me just uh, upload. Can you see the PowerPoint? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes, we can. Okay, then uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start my presentation. And uh, you know that during the spring meeting in the early April, we uh, uh, present uh, uh, you know, the uh, world economic outlook, where we expect that uh, Asia's growth rate will be, as you mentioned, will be 0% in 2020, uh, worse than uh, the growth rate during the global financial crisis, which is about 4.7%, and uh, during the Asian financial crisis in 1997, which is about 1.3%. And this 0% uh, growth rate was revised within a month, a month before April, we forecast the global growth rate is uh, uh, around 3.3. So it's a, there is a minus 6.3% swings in a month. So you can see how rapidly the world has deteriorated during the month. months. Uh, 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 and actually, uh, Asia has never experienced zero growth rate in the last 60 years where uh, when we actually begin to collect the data from the world. But having said that, uh, you know, we are focusing the U.S. growth rate will be around minus 5.9 percent 
and the eurozone growth rate will be around minus 7.5 percent so that means that uh, relatively speaking even though asia could not avoid the sharp drop of growth rate relatively speaking the asia still is uh, performing better than the others and uh, let me uh, we are focusing india's growth rate will be uh, uh, you know 1.9 percent in 2020 but the details i will ask uh, uh, our mission chief raniel to give a more detailed explanation later and then we actually break down uh, this revision uh, by following factors so the first uh, uh, you know the uh, the uh, uh, blue part uh, you know the black part uh, uh, domestic factors such as containment measures and then we also uh, another factor is external factors such as uh, disruption in trade and then also government policy response uh, can offset some of the decline so we break down uh, into and then the other factors is like uh, uh, commodity price changes and you know that uh, the oil price uh, drops actually helps india quite significantly so if we break down the our revision into these four factors as expected the domestic containment factors has the largest impact across countries and in india is not an exception uh, but the negative impact from the external factors such as low growth in advanced economies in US and Europe is also quite uh, play an important role. And then also policy response was very unprecedented in many countries and also played an uh, important, play important role. It's a combination of these factors. And then, uh, uh, you know, it's almost uh, a month after the, our spring meeting and uh, we had a new Q1 data uh, came recently. So this chart summarized the Q1 uh, performance of uh, uh, you know, major countries. And then uh, the black uh, and then, you know, the uh, middle uh, blue bar indicate quarter to quarter growth rate, which means that the growth rate between the, uh, you know, uh, last quarter in 2019 to the, uh, uh, to the first quarter in 2020, uh, black one is a non-annualized number. And then the blue one is annualized number. So you can multiply approximately maybe four times and you got these numbers. And then on the other hand, this light blue one is a year on year growth rate, which means that the first quarter in 2019, between the first in quarter in 2019 and then first quarter in 2020. As you can see, you can see the huge drop of economic activity in the first quarter of 2020, so which we expected. So, but uh, the US growth rate, uh, which is basically minus 1.2 in the first quarter and Eurozone growth rate minus 3.8% in uh, uh, growth rate was actually much stronger than we expected uh, because the, you know we ex we didn't expect that uh, uh, you know widespread of the disease uh, in US and Europe and their containment measures are very strong and then uh, there is no hope, sign that is going to uh, lift it very soon so which means that since the you know the first quarter performance of US and Eurozone uh, is uh, quite negative we expecting that the, our gross forecast of US 5.9% and the Eurozone's minus 7.5% may have a more chance to be revised down further. On the other hand, China's first quarter gross rate minus 9.8% is quite big. Uh, on the other hand, we expected that uh, China's first quarter will be as bad as this one because you know China started uh, uh, a lockdown from uh, December. So we expect that the first quarter will be quite bad. So in some sense, uh, China's for, uh, uh, for Q1 performance is in line with our expectation. But on the other hand, if you look at the you know, uh, poor performance of US and Eurozone, China and the many East Asian countries will be affected by the slowdown of global growth. So overall, I believe that the China has also uh, likely to, we, we, can, we, we are likely to see the more dino, downward division of our growth forecast, even in China. So I think at this moment, I'm very sorry to say, but uh, uh, looks like uh, uh, you know our very dismal forecast in April seems to be still uh, look optimistic, given the what is happening uh, uh, in the global uh, economy. Unless we will see the some new development of vaccine or some medicine uh, comes out uh, much quicker than we expected. So uh, uh, why the next issue that we address is why the slowdown? Uh, uh, you know. Uh, in uh, in this time is much stronger than even global financial crisis period. We can think about uh, three regions. First, 
Unlike during the global financial crisis, Asia's real sector is being hit hard by containment measures. And you can see in India, in, in China, in the world. Second, advanced economy slowdown is much faster than during the global fi uh, financial crisis. It has an implication for the global trade, which we are assuming that this year, global trade will go down by minus 10%. Third, China's growth rate. Uh, China's growth did not change very much at 9.4% in 2009, uh, thanks to their economy's uh, enormous fiscal expansion, which is about 8% uh, of GDP at the time. But China learned the hard lesson that the uh, uh, extraordinary stimulus may be good for the short term, but it can have unintended negative impact in the future. So uh, now this time they are very cautious in doing the fiscal stimulus. Uh, so far, they announced fiscal stimulus package around 3 to 4 percent, and they probably they will do more if the situation deteriorates. But uh, to be fair, I think it will be very hard to imagine that China will do uh, as uh, uh, you know, large stimulus as they did in 2009, which means that China at this time wouldn't uh, uh, bail out uh, you know, global economy or especially Asian economy. And then uh, another factor is that there is a hope. Uh, uh, you know, in April, we forecast relatively sharp, uh, you know, the recovery uh, uh, in, from 2021. For example, we are estimating uh, Asia's growth uh, rate will be above 7% in 2021. And, but that assumption, uh, you know, the fast recovery is assuming that, the, uh, you know, government stimulus package is working. And then also, uh, you know, we are assuming that this uh, virus the peak of the virus will happen in the second quarter of 2020. And so we are assuming the start of the partial recovery of the global economy from the third quarter in 2020. Under that assumption, we are expecting some kind of rapid recovery in 2021. But as you can see, as of now, we do not see the, that positive sign yet. So there are a lot of uncertainty. I'm, very to, uh, I'm sorry to say that this is not uh, focusing the you know, the economic statistics is basically focusing the, you know, epidemic curve, which is not our major. And then, as you mentioned, there are two other, uh, you know, important factors which will determine uh, uh, the future path of Asia's recovery. One is trade. As I mentioned, uh, the trade slowed down quite significantly. And it's not just the trade of goods, trade of services, tourism, and many others are actually uh, slowed down quite significantly. And uh, uh, you know, uh, given the slowdown of the uh, euro, euro, and uh, in, uh, in US, even though many Asian countries uh, handle this containment very successfully, so even though domestically they can control the uh, you know the virus, but as long as the you know virus continues in globally and then trade recovers very slowly, there is a strong head headwind in the nation's growth rate in down the road. And then, uh, uh, you know, there has been a, recently there's a, a, some good sign of stabilization, but in the beginning of the break of the coronavirus, we see that uh, the, there is a sign of the capital outflows from the emerging market, including India. And that was sharper than uh, uh, during the global financial crisis initially. And then especially the uh, uh, slowdown of the capital, uh, you know, actually the sign of capital outflows, outflows are much more manifest in Asia especially uh, from equity market, even the uh, relatively uh, better liquidity situation in Korea, uh, in, in Asia compared with other emerging market in the world. So uh, I'm very happy to see that uh, thanks to the very uh, uh, expansionary uh, uh, monetary policy in advanced economies, global financial market uh, condition is uh, now improved and stabilized. Uh, but on the other hand, if situation, uh, there are, I, we actually having a two different concerns. One is that uh, if the situation becomes worse, then there can be a restart of capital outflow pressure. That's one concern. On the other hand, if the advanced economies continue to rely on extraordinary, uh, you know, unconventional monetary policy and global interest rate remain low for longer, uh, there is also, uh, you know, risk-taking behaviors and there, there can be unintended uh, in consequences of too large, uh, too loose monetary policy. Uh, at this moment, you can see that uh, 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 you know the many risky asset is already recovered two thirds of the, their price drops, 
and and uh, and already and but uh, there there can be some issue of the credit rating of the many uh, uh, you know investment tools that uh, that investors are investing at this moment. So uh, let me just summarize the what is our policy recommendation at this moment. You know our bread and butter and the more comp uh, you know basic uh, our policy recommendation is that definitely first thing is to save life, and so. Uh, investing in health sector is very important, and then also you, to save the livelihood of the people who are heavily infected by disease. Targeted support is very important, and the central bank can uh, and should to work very hard to uh, maintain the market functioning. And then also uh, there is a pressure from the external sectors, so, so we have to maintain the stability in exchange rate market. And then you know when the recovery starts, probably we have to support domestic demand. But on the other hand, I think the real issue in Asia, and uh, especially India is a good example, and the re really big question that we have at this moment at the fund is this question. Uh, should Asia countries follow the uh, uh, US and European approach, which is whatever it takes, you know, do more expansionary and uh, expansionary fiscal and monetary policy. But on, uh, as you know that unlike US and uh, U uh, U uh, Europe, Many Asian countries doesn't have an internationalized currency. And so if they rely on too heavy expansion policy, the exchange rate market can be destabilized. So in that case, uh, how significantly uh, you know, the, uh, uh, we, they have to in, intervene in the FX market and stabilize the dollar liquidity conditions. At the same time, uh, you know, given the uh, limited uh, fiscal spaces, what should be the role of the central bank? This is probably in the short term is inevitable for many countries to rely on fiscal resources. In that case, given that the high level of the government debt already, uh, when the interest rate increase, what, what kind of function the central bank has to do? Should they intervene directly to the uh, government bond market purchases? Then what will happen to the independence of the central bank? All this question. So at this moment, uh, compare it's very unfair, but compare with the uh, advanced economies, which has, um, uh, which has uh, international currencies, so that they can actually print out money to uh, you know, cover with this kind of crisis. Many Asian economies and many emerging market economies has many constraints. So we are actually thinking about what should be the best uh, policy options that we have. And we, uh, uh, you know, then I think, uh, you know, especially uh, the sensitive issue is how we maintain the you know, exchange rate market and external market stability. Because if you do not have that external market stability, it will be very hard to rely on the domestic policy tools. So uh, in sum, I think this is a very difficult issue. This is a very sensitive issue and a new issue also for us. So uh, it, uh, the, our answer depends on very much on country specific. So I will ask Ranil to discuss this issue also somewhat uh, in his presentation of India economy. But basically, uh, uh, you know, if I just uh, uh, summarize key principles that we are doing at this moment, we think that uh, to the question that whether Asia has to rely on whatever it take approach, our answer is qualitative, uh, qualified yes, because current situation is quite significant. It's very important to prevent mass unemployment and to leave a scar so that, uh, so that uh, uh, I think a scar from the temporary liquidity problem getting into more structural form is very risky. So we think that uh, uh, Asian policymakers has to do some kind of whatever it takes, but considering their po uh, policy spaces and also limitation. So our general recommendation is that use transfers, but whenever it's possible, wherever it's possible, it should be targeted. And then, and then uh, also try to cooperate with uh, regional and the international uh, in, uh, in financial institutions uh, and use as much as po uh, possible uh, liquidity support, especially swaps. And then uh, the central bank has played a special role. Uh, they can use their balance sheet more flexibly to support the uh, SMEs and then also the uh, uh, large uh, fiscal uh, expenditures. At the same time, fiscal authorities has to have, uh, in the short term, they have to uh, have be more aggressive fiscal policies, but it's very important to have a medium term plan to make the uh, you know, fiscal policy more sustainable. So with a strong commitment, they can rely more flexibly on the short term expansion. And then, uh, you know, it uh, sounds very strange from the IMF views, but we believe that the, some measure of the capital flow measures, such as uh, FX intervention and capital flow controls, 
can be used temporarily and targeted whenever needed, uh, but it has to be temporary and then should be re uh, unwinded after the uh, crisis is over. And then also in general, Asia's strength is this high domestic saving. So I think we believe it's a time to use it wisely. Having, uh, with this, I think I will ask my uh, uh, colleague Raniel to have a presentation on India's side. Uh, I think, sorry that I'll really take a longer than I expected. Raniel, take off, please go over. Thank you, Chang. Thank you, Chang Yang. Um, let me load up my presentation. Okay. Um, good evening to all. Um, uh, and I would also uh, second Chang Yang in uh, thanking Vicky for arranging uh, this uh, our talk discussion today. Um, as Chang Yang mentioned, I will go more specifically into um, the situation or, or our outlook for India and recent developments on India as well. Before I start, um, if you look at uh, you know closely at uh, Chang Yang's slides on the growth comparison, you'll note you, you would have noted that the India numbers are on a fiscal year basis. Um, uh, so although we feel uh, India is doing better than what you would typically see globally, uh, if you looked at it on a calendar year basis, um, the numbers for India would also be lower. Um, so um, in, and we reduced India's growth forecast on a calendar year basis uh, from about five, we had before COVID from 5.6%, to 0.5%. Uh, so the downgrade was about 5%, which is similar to the downgrade for Asia, which is, of course, as Chang Young mentioned, um, somewhat less than the global downgrade. Um, so moving on to the next. Uh, so to start uh, with uh, some of the recent developments, I thought I would uh, review uh, recent uh, progress uh, related to uh, COVID-19. Um, uh, and uh, these three uh, panels here show the uh, developments. Um, the one on the left, of course, is uh, the total number of COVID cases as of late last week. Uh, and um, the day-to-day uh, -day changes in the confirmed number of cases. The middle panel shows uh, the five-day moving averages uh, for uh, confirmed, active, recovered, and uh, fatalities. Uh, and then the right one shows uh, the case fatality rate and the positive test rate. Um, so uh, I think early on in the period during the lockdown, we saw the uh, growth rate of cases come down fairly significantly. A little bit of our concern, which you can best see probably in the middle uh, panel there, is over the last 10 days, uh, the numbers have risen slightly. Um, which is saying that despite what we think was a very proactive effort by India to lock down the economy to and to minimize the uh, uh, progress of the disease, um, it hasn't um, fully uh, been able to do that yet. Um, the right side, though, um, suggests that um, it could at least partly reflect uh, better uh, testing. Um, we've seen India scale up uh, its testing pretty substantially, while still the uh, positive test rate remains, um, uh, at least seems to be dropping over the long term, uh, which is just uh, suggesting better testing is part of the factor. But I think also we've seen certain uh, outbreaks. Um, for example, uh, recently uh, we were noticing an uh, increase, for example, in Tamil Nadu in Chennai. Um, so it seems to be both a combination of better testing, but also the difficulties of containing uh, this virus. Uh, Chang Yang mentioned earlier in South Korea, they still have difficulties containing the virus. I think this is going to be an ongoing issue. So one question we have is um, to what extent the lockdown, we already have a partial easing of the lockdown, but to what extent uh, it the easing measures will progress uh, once lockdown 3.0 ends at the, um, at the end of this week. Um, 
at least initially, we've seen some preliminary indicators showing the impact uh, to the economy. Uh, and um, the impact is very dramatic. Uh, the left side are some consumption indicators. Of course, we have only limited um, indicators so far uh, beyond March, but already in March, you are seeing um, a significant impact. Uh, the right side shows uh, uh, in terms of uh, manufacturing, um, the uh, in index of industrial production is only through March. We're expecting to see a number, uh, sorry, through February, we're expecting to see a number for March uh, coming up later this week. But uh, at least the uh, purchasing man uh, managers indices for April have shown dramatic declines. The one we're showing there is uh, on the chart on the right, is for services which drop to uh, single digits, uh, which could be a record globally. Um, during the crisis, people have been looking at um, even more high frequency indicators than normal. Uh, one is uh, on the left side there is looking at uh, mobility data from Google and Apple. Um, the middle one there is crop arrivals at the, uh, the various Mondays, and the right one is on electricity cons uh, consumption. So again, you see a fairly dramatic hit uh, once the lockdown was implemented, um, but we are seeing some initial signs of recovery as uh, the lockdown uh, measures are starting to ease. So. Uh, as uh, Chang Yang mentioned, there's been a sizable downward revision to GDP growth. Um, the left side shows a little bit that already growth in India was slowing. Um, that primarily reflects the uh, difficulties we've seen in the non-bank financial sector over the last two years. Uh, and private domestic demand was even significantly weaker than overall uh, GDP growth. The right side shows um, how our forecast has changed. Um, so uh, if you look back in January, we were expecting growth uh, for uh, last fiscal year uh, to be 4.8 and 5.8 and 6.8. So 5.8 for this year. Um, uh, when we revised our projections in the World Economic Outlook uh, at the beginning of April, we lowered um, the previous fiscal year to 4.2, the current fiscal year to 1.9, and then a rebound to 7.4. Um, if uh, for the previous fiscal year, if we didn't see the impact of COVID because of data revisions for the first half, we actually would have upgraded growth for last fiscal year to 5.1. So the overall, we see an impact both in last fiscal year uh, because of the downturn in March related to COVID plus the impact of uh, the lockdowns and the other uh, impacts that Chang Yang described earlier for this fiscal year. One of the concerns we have now is uh, when we had done this forecast, we had assumed the lockdowns would last eight weeks, um, which was consistent with the developments uh, in China outside of Hubei province. Um, but as I mentioned, uh, given there still seems to be uh, some um, concerns about further need to mitigate the impact of the, the virus, uh, we wonder to what extent um, the lockdown, or at least partially the lockdown, will uh, continue beyond May 17th, which would mean we would have to consider uh, further downgrades to Indian growth. Um, also, I guess at the end of the month, we'll get the first read of uh, the first quarter, calendar year first quarter GDP growth, that will also allow us to reassess how badly um, the economy was hit by the lockdown in March. Although I would add the caveat there that typically the, the first advance estimate doesn't have completely comprehensive data for March. So we'll have to see exactly what the CSO says, how they took into account developments in March when they do the first advance release. Moving on to policy issues. Um, We've seen um, a fairly substantial easing in monetary policy. That's what the chart shows. Uh, even uh, preceding the COVID shock, uh, uh, the Reserve Bank of India had been reducing the repo rate. Uh, this was partly to assess the issues I mentioned earlier, which is the stress in the financial sector, particularly for the non-bank finance companies. 
since the COVID shock, the RBI has uh, reduced the repo rate by 75 basis points and the reverse repo rate by even more, uh, an additional 40 basis points. Uh, it has taken a number of other measures uh, to boost liquidity uh, and provide release, relief to borrowers. Uh, it has also gone further into longer term repo operations, um, trying to increase liquidity in parts of the financial sector uh, that uh, have uh, larger needs in terms of liquidity. I think the most recent step was uh, to provide liquidity uh, through banks, through mutual funds, to ease pressures on mutual funds. Um, we think these are all great, good measures, uh, but as Chang Young mentioned, we think also that further easing is, will, is needed and the RBI has signaled that uh, with likely additional measures. Moving on to fiscal policy. Uh, Dr. Reddy mentioned that we're waiting to, uh, perhaps for a package uh, this week, uh, and uh, uh, we hope uh, that uh, there will be more announced soon. Um, now, the context for India is that fiscal space uh, is, is limited. Um, and you can see on the left the evolution of the central government deficit, uh, as well as a concern we've had in recent years in terms of off budget borrowing. Um, so when you put those together, the fiscal deficit in India is quite high. That said, there is an urgent need uh, to support vulnerable households and um, uh, also healthcare, along with uh, firms, um, small and medium sized firms, um, uh, to avoid the scarring issues that uh, Chang Young mentioned. Um, we, uh, we've seen announced stimulus measures of about 1.1% of GDP when you co combine both the center and state level. But we think, and we emphasize here, that's why in bold that more is needed. Uh, however, because of the underlying fiscal issues in India, uh, which I started with, which is the limited space, we think it is very important uh, as well, though, once the crisis is over, that um, a credible and detailed fiscal consolidation plan could also be announced even today, uh, which could help lower cost, lower concerns uh, about uh, borrowing cost increasing. Um, we think if you have a credible plan that will ease any concerns for the market and there could help uh, India lower potential borrowing costs. Um, of course, uh, one of the issues for some time in India has been the stress in the financial sector. Uh, initially, that stress we saw in uh, the public sector banks, uh, and you can see the difference uh, in the chart on the left uh, uh, between the various ratios for the public sector banks, private sector banks, and foreign banks in India, uh, related to the capital adequacy ratio, credit growth uh, in recent years, as well as um, gross non-performing assets. Um, the RBI, uh, in recent years, the last couple of years as well, we've had stress in the non-bank financial financing companies. Um, the RBI's uh, measures that it has taken so far um, was to ensure liquidity in the financial system. And as I mentioned already, um, including for uh, NBFCs and mutual funds uh, more recently. Uh, it also uh, allows for a three month moratorium on loans um, for um, uh, bank, uh, but that can weigh on banks and NBFCs. Um, and one of our concerns over the longer term is that asset quality could deteriorate during the current crisis. Um, one of, uh, I would still put it as uh, somewhat a relative positive for India is despite uh, both very weak uh, weakness in trade growth in March, and we expect that to continue throughout the fiscal year, as well as the uh, capital outflows, uh, which occurred in, primarily in March, um, we think uh, the external uh, sector is relatively strong for India. India benefits 
from lower oil prices, which has will have an impact in lowering India's current account deficit, uh, as well as uh, it has relatively low external debt. Uh, that along with very high foreign reserve buffers that the RBI holds, uh, uh, I think the latest data shows that reserves are back up to uh, slightly above 480 billion, uh, gives uh, India substantial external buffers. Uh, and this is something that I think uh, helps with the uh, ability of uh, India to respond, at least the Reserve Bank of India to re respond to uh, their pressures. Um, <clears throat> so uh, with that, I'll, I'll stop for now and we can move on to the question section. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Ranil, for that uh, presentation. Um, if I may just request uh, participants to uh, put in any questions in the chat box. I think we have about uh, four questions. Um, so I, I'll just uh, um, uh, ask uh, the question as it is written. We might have answered some, some in your presentation, but you might need to uh, give some clarification. The first one is on the fiscal deficit. Uh, many governments can have fiscal deficit to 15%, including PSU borrowings, uh, central and state budget deficits. How do you think uh, we can monetize to increase government spending? Uh, should they be you know, looking at currency or raise government bonds or borrow money? That's a, the first question, uh, which is actually come in here. Uh, maybe I can address that issue. This is Chang Yong. I think monetization of government uh, uh, deficit is a sensitive issue. And then actually, if you look at the, what uh, the advanced economy is doing it, I would rather say that it's not direct monetization, but their unconventional QE actually has that kind of favor. So there is a lot of pressure in Asia. I think India is an, an, one good example. As they increase uh, fiscal deficit, the interest rate, uh, especially long-term interest rate, is start to increase because of the you know, pressure in the uh, uh, fiscal spaces. So in that case, uh, should uh, Asia has to monetize its deficit? I think that we do not have that luxury. In advanced economies, currently the inflation is very low. They have international uh, currencies. So actually when they print out money, the pressure on the exchange rate and the external market is relatively light. So they have a luxury to do that. But in many Asian economies, uh, if you do try to follow that route, uh, the, uh, so far we do not have a you know, very proven record of the central bank institutions quality and the independence, all this issue, and inflation is relatively high. So we cannot exclude the possibility and we cannot assure that uh, you know, monetization wouldn't cause inflation in the down the road. So what, but on the other hand, how we can resolve this issue, this is one of the you know, topic that I discussed in my presentation. We have to think about some uh, different way of doing it. At this moment, I, we can think about two, two uh, ways of handling this one. One is a more like a yield, yield curve targeting like what Japan is doing. So maybe we do the more uh, segmented intervention to uh, prevent uh, some of the uh, spike in the government bond interest rate uh, if uh, you know, government has to issue large amount of government bond. Or more fundamentally second, we are thinking about some temporary solution. For example, like a, a central bank can intervene and to buy uh, in the secondary market, definitely in a government bond, but not primary market. Uh, but that has uh, some risk. So in that case, uh, you know, uh, government can provide some kind of, uh, 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 you know, the guarantee. Uh, if you look at the, what US and the UK is doing at this moment, you know, paycheck protection plan, all these things, government basically provide about 10% of uh, credit guarantee to the central bank purchase of the, uh, you know, risk asset, such as like uh, loans to the uh, uh, you know, small and medium enterprises, and also the paycheck support uh, for the private bank when they uh, extend the loan to the private sector. So my point is that the central bank can intervene some quasi-fiscal 
activity which can actually have some risk to help the, reduce the pressure from the fiscal authorities, but with the guarantee uh, from the central bank, I mean the government, that can cause uh, some uh, uh, which off, off balance, uh, you know, fiscal activity, but in temporary, but that actually is a good compromise to maintain the central bank independence. And then, you know, later on, uh, uh, you know, uh, ex post, they can actually sort out the who, who bear the cost. So I think that is a kind of way to avoid uh, some kind of uh, immediate, uh, you know, the increase in interest rate at the same time to maintain the central bank independence. At the same time, uh, as Ranil mentioned, this one has to come with a medium term credible, uh, you know, solution uh, for fiscal consolidation. Without it, I think this policy won't work. I'll stop here. But it looks like uh, Dr. Reddy has some questions. So, uh, uh, Mr. Lee, we completely agree actually with the recommendation and Fiki had uh, submitted a very detailed plan to the government which spoke about the stimulus of demand and money in the hands of the vulnerable. It spoke about a business continuity plan which should enable liquidity for the medium scale and the large corporations. And the ideology was really we lend from the bank, but you have a back, I mean, we borrow from banks, but we have a a sovereign guarantee because as you know, currently because of the proactive steps of the central bank or the RBI, our banks are flush with funds, but they are risk averse. So we need the sovereign guarantee to enable the liquidity to flow. Um, this is something that we're hoping and expecting for. We also gave in certain recommendations on other core sectors. But my question, to, and we, we actually completely agree with you and had included the strategy around uh, the fiscal consolidation plan uh, and the, you know, a good plan so that there would be no downgrading of ratings. But if I may very directly ask you, uh, what do you believe is the extent of requirement from the government to be able to uh, stop this recessionary trend? How much fiscal stimulus would be required? What is a, a ballpark range that you would recommend to the government? Uh, I think that should be very country specific. But if you look at the uh, uh, fiscal measures at, at this moment, if you look at the advanced economies, we have to measure the fiscal activity in two ways. One is I call, call more genuine and uh, bread and butter fiscal policy, which is like uh, you know, the subsidies and, uh, you know, the government expenditures on infrastructure, all these things. But also, uh, there is uh, some kind of quasi-fiscal activity, such as the loans, guarantee, all these things. And if you look at the numbers, uh, for example, U.S., uh, uh, you know, the uh, fiscal, pure fiscal activity is around 8 to 8% 8 of GDP. But if you increase the, some of the other lending facilities and the guarantee, the numbers increase quite significantly. Germany uh, is well over 30 percent, and uh, in Japan is about 20 percent, including all this loan and guarantee, all these things. And uh, U.S. is well over uh, 15 percent. But on the other hand, if you look at the emerging market, the major you know, fewer fiscal activities, like as in India, like uh, 2 percent maybe, a maximum around 3 percent. If, if, even if you include uh, some uh, loan guarantee, all these things, the number is below 5 percent. In case in between, like uh, Korea, is uh, the number is around above, including all loan guarantee others is around six to seven percent. Why? As I mentioned, it's purely because of the whether you have international currency or not, and the, whether you have a uh, uh, previously fiscal space or not. So definitely, uh, is that the lower figure of the advanced uh, emerging market than advanced economy is a bad sign? There is a sign that they are not doing enough. I don't think so because it really reflects the uh, policy constraint because of the lag of international currency and then some of the fiscal space and the credit rating issues. So that is why I say that the emerging markets have a more delicate uh, you know, the problem. There's a pros and cons. So I think uh, I will ask Ranil to uh, inter uh, give you a more concrete answer for India. But uh, my point is that uh, this, what is a magic number depends on two things. One is uh, what is your current situation? For example, like in Korea, I do not want to recommend them to use more fiscal space as of now because they are relatively containing the, uh, you know, the spread and the growth rate is not as permitted as in other countries. So unless, the, uh, you know, they have another round of the negative shock, 
maybe six to seven percent and the total fiscal packages with a fiscal deficit around three percent is a good thing to maintain the uh, you know the credibility of the policies and like india you know it depends on how 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 badly the shock will be and then how will be the future course of the you know economic conditions so that's one factor the other factor is definitely uh, the trade off have a more expansion policy what will be its impact on the uh, external market and especially the exchange rate pressure or kind of thing that is uh, something that uh, we cannot avoid considering uh, unlike the advanced economies having said that i'm asked ranil uh, do you have a view on the how large the uh, you know the stimulus packages in india now uh, so far, uh, can I, um, uh, so far, uh, as I mentioned, um, the uh, package uh, headline number is 1.1% of uh, GDP. That's both at the center and state level, so general government level. Um, we think uh, that at least an additional 1.5% uh, is needed for households. Uh, of course, as Chang Young mentioned, mentioned it also depends if to what extent uh, the lockdown continues um and uh we are having a little more difficulty assessing the needs of um indian firms um we don't have as much information on on small and medium sized firms for example but we assume something similar may be needed but at least for firms as dr reddy mentioned you could have the government um, it could be channeled through the financial system, the banks, with governments uh, having, um, kind of taking on the first loss type thing. So perhaps the fiscal cost, one, would first be contingent, and second, would be smaller um, as kind of a fiscal backstop. So uh, for households, we have a better read, and we think at least about 1.5% of GDP is needed. That's both at the state and uh, federal levels. Um, and then uh, our early guess was something comparable, but with the caveat that it could be more in this contingent basis for firms. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you both for that. And if there's any more data that you need or at any point, uh, Fiki would be very happy to, you know, share that data or partner with you to, to do more detailed work on this. But thank you very much for your detailed responses. Our thought process is is very similar. Thank you. Thank you, Reddy. We may follow up on uh, with you on the data issue. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Ranil, I think Philip was trying to say something. Yeah, Ranil, there's a follow up uh, question, uh, you know, and this is the trade off between the. So, how much space is there for, uh, for with India to increase its uh, deficit without uh, threatening a downgrade on its ratings? This is a question from Vishal Periwal. Right. Uh, we haven't spoken to the rating agencies, so uh, this would be based uh, on um, kind of a, a general guess. Uh, I think the real issue for India is the longer term in terms of the debt path. So that's why we've been particularly uh, emphasizing the need for a credible medium term fiscal, uh, you know, the better, more detailed, the better for once the COVID crisis is over. Um, we think that would mitigate risk um, for a ratings downgrade. Uh, we also think it will uh, bring better confidence for the market to um, uh, so that uh, government deals will not rise too much. Uh, so I think that's uh, part of the key, um, credible medium term uh, fiscal strategy. Uh, we also think as part of that, there should be increased fiscal trans transparency. Um, we mentioned the increase uh, we've seen um, over the last few years in some of the off-budget borrowing. Um, if better fiscal transparency, we think will also assist in terms of building medium-term credibility for India's fiscal policy. Okay. So there's a there's a there's a question uh, which is um, um, uh, that the uh, um, okay the, the, okay so saying the current healthcare spend in India is about one point three percent of GDP 
uh, what should it be in the post covid uh, crisis and how do we uh, what are the options actually to generate that investment um quickly on that uh, we did some estimates uh, related through our fiscal affairs department in terms of additional spending related to the covid crisis on that it's not a substantial number um uh, the 0.1, 0.2%, 0.1% .1 .1 already announced um, will help a lot. Uh, it may need to be scaled up somewhat further if the uh, virus continues to spread. However, over the medium to longer term, this is an area where India has to significantly scale up uh, its, um, its uh, expenditures. Uh, healthcare expenditures in India relative to other comparators are too low. Uh, we've done some work with Niti Aayog on sustainable development goals, and that would be an area that over time, over the medium term, uh, would require a substantial increase in expenditures, especially as um, even though India has a relatively young population, over the next 20, 30 years, uh, India does face a population aging issue. Thanks, sir. Uh, I think there's a question to Dr. Ree from Sachinan Shukla. They said, you, uh, Dr. Ree, you mentioned Asia should use savings wisely. What should India do specifically? General, I think uh, uh, what I may meant is that, uh, uh, you know, many Asian, India is actually uh, uh, not that category, I'm, I'm sorry to say. I'm talking about the case of the many East Asian countries, which has a current account surplus previously. So saving investment gap, uh, they have uh, more savings. And uh, uh, so actually uh, for them now, uh, they can actually use their their savings more recycling within themselves and then also to, uh, use that fund. Uh, in the case of India, uh, your, uh, your current account is uh, unlike the, uh, you know, uh, China and East Asia, your case is actually investment is bigger than uh, saving. You have a current account uh, deficit. So the, my remark on uh, utilizing more your saving at this moment is, is more East Asia, not for India. Thank you. Uh, there is also a, 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 you know, a follow-up question, Ranil, to your ratings thing. Is it, uh, is it uh, you know, will it be the interest of everybody if the rating agencies globally put rating changes on hold for the next one year at least, uh, given the unprecedented nature of the crisis? And if I can just, Add to that, I think um, like ratings are also relative and the whole world is suffering. And we're currently in an environment where we don't have a playbook. Can rating agencies uh, change the way they look at things to enable uh, governments to do what's right? Yeah. Dr. Reddy, uh, can I actually, Ranil give up in principle, can I just intervene? I recently talked to rating agency on this issue and uh, their uh, principal answer is that uh, they are not looking at just one year government deficit uh, when they actually decide the rating. So that is why uh, Ranir and we emphasize more the medium term plan. So even if you have uh, uh, some expenditure increase uh, because to cope with the uh, uh, coronavirus, but if you can explain this is temporary and then you have a very strong uh, registration and uh, commitment to bring it back, I think as rating agency will respond. But if you just use it and then also use the resources and sometimes you, you introduce some more permanent measures rather than temporary measures to uh, cope with these things because of political reason, there are many political incentives coming in. And so that if the rating agency think this kind of change has a permanent impact, it will definitely affect your ratings. So in principle, I'd rather say that uh, very important to announce uh, uh, you know, it's inevitable that you have to use some fiscal resources at this moment. It's a no-brainer, but it has to come up with a very convincing uh, commit, uh, commitment for fiscal consolidation. At the same time, you know, even though you can say, okay, we will reduce it, but if the increase amount is really huge in the beginning, then I think nobody will believe, right? So this is more like art, but uh, when we talk about the rating agencies, they are really emphasize that they are not just looking at the one number, they are looking at the you know, the multi-period, you know, fiscal conditions. Thank you. I think there's a, there's a, there are two or three linked questions regarding, you know, China and India. So they're saying looking forward to the recovery phase, is there an indication that China could benefit from supply chains moving out of China 
and uh, what uh, should India do actually to become more attractive for that? I've combined three questions into these two questions. Okay, uh, let me uh, focus on the China cases myself. And then uh, my deputy, uh, Anne-Marie, is joining us, uh, us, and she's actually leading the so-called, we call Pivot to South Asia project, which means that we are now currently studying how we actually develop manufacturing sector and supply chain in South Asia in the future, including actually India is a major country we are studying. So let me ask Anne-Marie to answer this, your second part of the questions about India. For the value chain in China, I think I have to emphasize that the change in value, global value chain in China has already started uh, long before the, this coronavirus outbreak. Many reasons. First of all, wage rate uh, uh, in China has increased. So, and then China is also upgrading uh, their value chain. So uh, many international uh, businesses which operate in China uh, is actually, uh, is now seeing, thinking, whether they have to go to more West region or whether they have to go to the other ASEAN and other countries to moving their uh, really uh, labor intensive uh, industries. So definitely for their own China's incentive to move upward their value chain, also because of incentive of uh, international businesses looking for a more cost effective way, there is a definitely trend of moving their value chain uh, out of China and we that, that can be opportunity for India and many other ASEAN countries. On the other hand, there's a new emergence of the new value chain even before the coronavirus uh, outbreak in China. For example, China is now become a, a moving from a factory in, uh, uh, in, in the world to the consumer in the world. They are now rising middle, in, uh, middle income classes. They, they are looking for the more high quality consumption. So let me, I know the more uh, knowledge of the Korean companies. In the first stages, many Korean companies who actually produce uh, intermediate manufacturing goods was operating there. Now they are retreating. So new business coming in. What kind of businesses? Movie theater, bakery shops, and a high consumer product such as uh, cosmetics and other things. Because and then they are producing within China to you know to make it uh, more uh, easily accessible to Chinese consumers. So new value chain actually changing within China. But having said that, I think after coronavirus, this anti-globalization sentiment and then also the deglobalization will be an impact important factor in considering the new paths. At the same time, we have been focusing mostly on the supply chain of the manufacturing goods. But this coronavirus actually teaches us that global supply chain of service products, such as medical product, food, and then also tourism. And uh, you know that will change a lot, and then we probably have to see the opportunities. India is very strong in so uh, in the service sector. I really like the Dr. Reddy's comment that it's a time to think about windmill rather than horns. I think uh, in that sense, I think how we look at the service sector, and so in many actually India is emphasizing very much on the manufacturing source of global supply chain. But I I, I believe that uh, whether you can actually make uh, your service sector internationalized after the coronavirus things. That also can be a very interesting question. Having said that, let me invite uh, my deputy Anne Marie to talk about how we can promote manufacturing and global value chain uh, within Asia. Anne Marie. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you and good evening. Um, as uh, Cheng Yong mentioned, uh, we have actually uh, a, a big ongoing research project uh, in the IMF on, um, on the growth potential of South Asia. Uh, this predated the COVID crisis, but it is now become even more important with the COVID crisis. I mean, what should India do to uh, use its growth potential? And uh, let me just emphasize that our research really uh, shows that South Asia uh, has a growth potential and will need to become one of the growth engines, not only of Asia, but, uh, but more, uh, more globally. So looking at that and looking at the obstacles, um, what what is it that India needs to do to uh, strengthen its manufacturing sector? Um, we have in in our research identified a number of issues, uh, and they they relate. I mean, they're basically uh, on on the structural side. Um, we know that there are um, that India has a very uh, regulated, a highly regulated labor market, uh, which prevents uh, firms from hiring and, and firing flexibly. And uh, while there needs to be 
of course, adequate labor protection, uh, those things need to be looked at in, in terms of also not hindering the flexibility. Um, there is another um, important issue that relates uh, to land, land rights, uh, land acquisition for firms. Again, an issue that needs to be uh, reflected on in terms of what does it do to the flexibility of firms. Important issues are also related to trade. First, first of all, uh, imported inputs in India are, are taxed uh, much higher than in other countries and often more than uh, than imports of, uh, of finished goods. So this is an, an obstacle to the growth of firms and the growth of manufacturing. And then um, it, the business environment uh, with many other smaller regulations. So a careful assessment of the business uh, in environment will be needed to support the manufacturing. And finally, uh, our, um, our research also points uh, important to education issues. While India, as, as has been emphasized, has a world-class tertiary education system that has led to a highly competitive uh, exports of services, uh, primary and secondary education for for broader um, groups of, uh, of of the population uh, remain uh, there remain significant issues that need to be addressed so um, we have done we have published a paper in october in our regional education uh, economic outlook that details some of this and we are working on a, at a more in-depth study that is going to be published later later this year and we're looking forward to discussing this uh, more closely with uh, indian uh, uh, with indian authorities but those are it's, it's a high level summary of of the issues that i wanted to raise thank you Thank you very much, Anne-Marie. And, you know, uh, the other questions which uh, which I just uh, clubbed two of them together. Uh, getting the Indian economy back on rails needs demand re revival. Uh, urban India is still in a state of paranoia over COVID-19, uh, whereas rural India is less impacted. What are your thoughts on simulating growth through farm productivity, food processing, and rural infrastructure? And a linked uh, uh, question uh, is, uh, there is, will multilateral agencies like IMF consider a concessional funding program to developing nations uh, like India for the economic rehabilitation required post COVID lockdown? The two questions. You go, you go first, Raniel goes first and I'll answer the second, second questions, Raniel. Um, so, uh, we do agree that uh, there is a significant scope uh, in terms of rural India, uh, in particularly in terms of agriculture. Um, so, uh, some of the elements you already mentioned um, in terms of rural infrastructure uh, will be very important. Um, there are also, again, issues related to land that Anne-Marie had pointed out earlier uh, and the ability uh, to uh, essentially uh, trade shift land as needed. Um, uh, and then um, I, the other part of it, I think in terms of improving rural uh, productivity is longer term in terms of creating um, additional jobs for rural workers, not just necessarily in agriculture, but in ancillary industries, including you know, processing of uh, food, which is uh, both agriculture as well as manufacturing. Um, so uh, we think this is a crucial area for India, uh, given it is still a substantial portion of the Indian economy. Productivity can be increased, but also we need to provide other uh, work uh, for uh, uh, rural Indian workers as well. So, uh, that I think as, for, yeah. as for the second question, what kind of IMF facility can help the India and other emerging and developing countries? Uh, for uh, you know, the fund is not a development agencies. So, for more development support, uh, the World Bank and ADB actually can provide more direct uh, you know support for development need and uh, some COVID related health sector and sectoral support. On the other hand, still uh, IMF is providing a lot of facilities and the money uh, for to stabilize the market in a macro sense. So, if I just introduce uh, two uh, facilities. One is our emergency lending facilities, we call RCF and RFI, and that is more uh, to help the countries which is suffering some short-term balance of payment uh, problems uh, due to the, some natural disasters or like a coronavirus kind of cases. 
So we already have already helped 50 countries around the world for this through this rapid credit facility. And uh, about 100, 100 countries in the world are show interest in using these facilities. Uh, uh, but I think, as I, uh, Ranil mentioned, that India is of, uh, you know, you know, a large emerging market and you have a, a large buffers in the reserves. So I don't think that uh, this uh, uh, rapid emerging uh, facilities is for India at this moment. On the other hand, we have uh, recently uh, in the spring meeting, we introduced a new facility called short-term liquidity line. That is actually to help uh, the innocent bystanders uh, through the global financial turmoil. Uh, so for example, like uh, during the global financial crisis, the shock happens in advanced economies, but actually because of the uh, global market turmoil, uh, there are a lot of capital outflow uh, flow pressure to the emerging market, including Asia. So we learned from that lesson. So we uh, decided to having uh, this new facility, we call the short-term liquidity lines, which is completely different from the our uh, lending facility for the country, which has in fact uh, the balance of payment crisis itself. This is just prevent innocent bystanders with uh, with high performance to uh, uh, protect uh, to be protected from the global financial turmoil. And so we uh, introduced this new facility in this fall, which doesn't have any stigma. So uh, in case if the current situation become deteriorate further then uh, you know, good performing large emerging markets can benefit uh, from these facilities. Let me stop here. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Ri. Uh, I think that just, I think there's time for one last question, which, I, which I'll ask and then, uh, I think the question is like, what should the government in India do to uh, protect uh, domestic manufacturing in India in the short term survival and the long term revival in the fiscal and trade uh, reforms and what is uh, the you know the impact uh, on the extended lockdown on the Indian economy, especially for MSMEs? Actually, that was the first part of the question, and the second part was what should the government do? Okay, uh, let me start, and then I will ask Anne Marie. And uh, since it's the last question, I ask Anne Marie and Ranil to add if they have anything to uh, add. To speak frankly, uh, when I heard uh, when your questions how to protect domestic industries. I think the word protect is a wrong word. You know, you know, at this moment, if you really want to develop your own manufacturing sector, it's a competition, right? And then you have to have a world-class manufacturing. You do not want to have a, you know, manufacturing your own, but it's not a world-class, then uh, it's not survival. So I think uh, I can understand the intention uh, because it's a short-term difficulties. So we have to protect the domestic industry and domestic uh, livelihood of the people. But on the other hand, if you really want to have a compet uh, you know, world-class manufacturing sector, world protection, I think is not a, a good word. Let me give an example. I know that uh, Anne-Marie mentioned many things, but uh, I, we find that uh, the tariff rate on the intermediate goods, uh, manufacturing goods is very high in India. And that may be our intention to protect the small and medium enterprise in manufacturing sector. On the other hand, if you do not have a good intermediate good, how can you make a good final goods based on that? So uh, we believe that the first thing to you have to address in the developing manufacturing sector is to have a very competitive, uh, you know, the uh, in, uh, intermediate goods, high quality ones, so that you can be competitive in the final good too. So, and then also we talk about the global value chain, but I'm very sorry to say, but we, our recommendation is India has to integrate domestically first. So the uh, integration with the world, starting from the integration from the, uh, uh, you know, within India, India is a, Big country, it's not like one con small country. So I think I'm very glad that uh, you know India's government doing a great effort in that direction. We see that the merit of the uh, you know integration of the value added tax is very important first step to integrate all India within themselves. So I think that uh, you know we are now talking about coronavirus, and this, so we are talking about protecting the livelihood people and the SMEs all this, which is very important in the short term. But at the same time, most of the question you address is a medium term issue in that uh, for that, I think competition and the integration and those things are very important world, not world protection. With that, I think, let me ask uh, Raniel and uh, uh, and marie to add, Raniel, especially if you can add what kind of things government has to do to protect the people's livelihood, please go ahead. 
Sure. Um, some of it would be, uh, at least for the people, the households, it would be uh, d probably direct fiscal support, which we discussed earlier. Uh, also, even in terms of the small and medium-sized enterprises, the uh, what we need to do is make sure, though, those in firms that are suffering during the lockdown will not, um, so we don't want to make a liquidity problem into a solvency problem. So we need to provide those firms with liquidity. Um, that is clear. And um, again, the innovative ideas that I think Vicky has proposed to the government, uh, we, we would agree with. Um, finding ways for the banks that have a huge amount of liquidity and are in part sitting on the liquidity to start channeling that out. However, we don't want the banks to take the risk. Uh, the government has to take that risk. So um, the government has to set up some facility where it either directly contributes to um, providing this liquidity or it's a contingent uh, liability to the, to the government to ensure that the financial sector doesn't um, take on that credit risk. Um, but we do believe, uh, and it sounds like Fiki thinks the same way, it is urgent to provide the support for the, um, the uh, especially the smaller firms, but there could be also lo some larger firms that are adversely impacted by um, it due to the lockdown. Uh, and then finally, I strongly endorse what Chang Young said in terms of intermediate goods. Uh, we, that's one of the things we think is a major, and Marie mentioned it as well, a major hindrance to India entering global value chain. And Marie, please go ahead. Uh, yes, I mean, I, I fully agree with what has been said. I think the, uh, the particular cha challenge for India is that uh, India was already in a structure that was about to change to take advantage of uh, a fuller integration into the global economy and uh, um, building a more um, competitive manufacturing uh, sector. So at this stage, as has been stressed, there is a need to protect both uh, both people and, and, and jobs and firms, but the measures that are being taken should not be uh, cementing structures that have to that have to change. So this is a it, it's a it's, it's a very big challenge, and uh, it it is uh, important that um, that the, the measures to support the individuals are taken as in the first place, but that uh, other structural and economic policy measures that could prevent longer term competitiveness of the Indian economy are being being thought rethought very very carefully and again i would go back to the measures that chang yong and ranil mentioned and what i said before you know the, to address these structural challenges for the indian economy those challenges need to continue to be addressed uh, even maybe with more urgency in the context of the um, of the covid uh, let me stop here Thank you, Chang Yong, uh, Anne Marie, and Ranil. Um, there are many other questions, but I'm, I apologize to everybody who's asked a question. We're running out of time uh, here. And uh, I think what we could do is Anshuman could actually mail some of this across to the IMF. And if there are any particular things that they want to share, we will get it and share back with you. Uh, at this time, I invite uh, Mr. Peter Rimmel, uh, Resident Representative of India of the KAS, to please uh, conclude this session. Peter, over to you. Pleasure for me on behalf of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation to deliver the vote of thanks. We hear so much about downgrading. I don't want to continue with that. I rather try to upgrade right, right, to the speakers. And of course, first of all, Mr. Chang Yong Ri, the director of the Asia Pacific Department of the IMF, and his colleagues, Anne Marie and Ranil, a great thank you for sharing your insight. It was not only an interesting event, it was helpful, I think, for India in shaping its, its uh, strategic uh, decisions. So, Gamsa Hamida, vielen Dank. Thank you very much for uh, having your input. And I also like Fiki again, especially Dr. Sankita Reddy, the president, for the partnership we share since long to make such events possible and fruitful for all sides. It's not only that the growth is going down, the structures of the world economy are changing. And obviously, there is a trend of de-globalization. Governments 
including the Indian one, are acting increasingly protectionist. Now, I'm using that word. In my opinion, it's not only the wrong word. I think protectionism is, at least in the long term, the wrong strategy. I may say that more clear um, in my position. So companies are reconsidering their international supply chains and long-term supply may supply security may count more than cost efficiency as it has done in the past. Most economists agree that governments are doing the right thing in putting lots of money into recovery means into stimulus measures. And uh, as it was said also by uh, Mr. Ri, the approach of whatever it takes, but adapted to the situation of India is still the right strategy. As far as I know, the IMF has estimated also, and that comes back to the question of Mr. Ri by saying, who bears the cost of all that at the very end? And the IMF has estimated that national debts now following the money flowing for the corona crisis in most countries will increase to more than 100 percent of the economic performance and even in weaker economies up to 200 percent so are state bankruptcies and hyperinflation the consequences destroying currencies and savings of citizens it doesn't have to be like that the risk is there but not necessarily and the, uh, allow me to quote the former chief economist, Monsieur Olivier Blanchard of uh, IMF. He came to a very simple formula. He said, if the interest rate is lower than the economic growth, a state can be indebted without risking demise. Maybe that includes all these rating issues, uh, things discussed. Historically, and I'm looking at Europe especially, this difference empowered many of the European states to reduce their war related debt burden. And the same mechanism could work with Corona related state debts if the growth rate of the economy is above the interest level. And I think that is where, where governments have to work on together with the, the industry, together with the service sector, together with agencies like FICI, uh, that basically there is a healthy balance between the growth rate and the interest rate. Trade was mentioned has slumped by about 10%. I'm looking at India and the European Union specifically, Germany being India's largest trade partner. And that reminds me that both tried to increase their trade and trade is always, if you have extensive trade, it's always an instrument for growth and growth is, as we have said, what we need and what we look at. So in this situation, maybe one could look at an instrument what has not been realized yet, the free trade agreement between the European Union and India. Just the day before yesterday, on the 9th of May, we have celebrated the Europe Day, which made us introspect as to what all did the European integration achieve. They didn't look too much what they didn't achieve yet, but working on it. Nowadays, the European Union may be considered as one of India's core like-minded partners, a partnership key to a balanced and multipolar global order, but with potential unrealized. And that potential could be in trade and under changed conditions to have a look at it from both sides at the free trade agreement that was started in 2007. They dealt long with it and came to no conclusion and finally uh, ended it. Last year saw a trade agreement between the EU and Japan coming into force. So such things are possible. And I think if both sides look at where are their interests, how come, can they overcome, then it could be an instrument contributing to recovery, contributing to growth of trade and to national growth in India and the EU. So having said all that, uh, the EU-India free trade agreement is particularly important and should be given special attention by the EU when working on a coherent external trade and investment strategy in South Asia in particular vis-a-vis -vis the US and China, which are on the one hand important trade partners for the EU, but on the other hand, strong competitors in the region. 
So that was a slight European perspective. I'd like to thank all of you again for this really interesting event, and I'll head back to Delhi. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Peter. Thank you, uh, President. Thank you, uh, Chang Yong Ri and, and Anne Marie and Ranil. Uh, thank you, all the participants uh, for attending. And my apologies to those uh, participants who could not, I could not translate their questions to the IMF team. But thank you, and this is the end of the uh, session. Thank you very much. Have a pleasant day, uh, Ms. Dr. Ree in, in Washington, and uh, a pleasant evening to all the rest of the people in India. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye and namaste. Look forward to meeting namaste. you in person in the future. Namaste, and uh, it's, a namaste. Great, it's a great learning opportunity. I hope that uh, you know, there are a lot of interest in the Indian economy in DC. So I hope that uh, we can invite you uh, for one of the teleconference so that you can teach us the, your own view on the India with a deep uh, insight. So thanks again for the opportunity. privilege to participate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, also to share your views on how we can enhance investment in India, uh, you know, protect the Indian economy. We, we will look forward to continuing to stay in dialogue. I'll ask uh, I'll ask uh, Anne Marie to update our study and then send you the our publications.